Larry Diamond, he's going to be talking about additional benefits of low carb with fasting. So Larry Diamond has been following a low carb, healthy fat, paleo and fasting lifestyle since 2013. He has lost 120 pounds and reversed many chronic diseases. His wife joined him. There we go. His wife joined him in 2014, way to pave the way, and also reversed many conditions and lost 70 pounds. He became a primal certified health coach through Mark Sisson, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, to help more people. Currently, he is, fat, he is a fasting and diet educator with the extensive dietary management program. He is interested in serving individuals and families with the most effective diet and lifestyle changes that reduce appetite, turn people into fat-burning beasts, improve metabolic and mitochondrial health, and that are enjoyable and sustainable for life. So everybody, I give you Larry Diamond. Um, first of all, thanks to this awesome gentleman, uh, Chris, and his equally awesome wife, Miriam. And uh, I had never, um, sorry, I didn't know Cameron prior to today, um, but we had that commonality. And I was the first one in my household to decide that lifestyle was going to be my approach to taking control of my future health, and not just physical health, but mental health, spiritual health, energy levels. And I had reached my go time, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Oops. So, of course, my first time here. There we go, touch screen works multiple backups. Um, my disclaimer, as Cameron mentioned, I'm an IDM educator and I'm also developing an IDM executive program, uh, longevity, and we're working with performance athletes, combining fasting and dietary uh, protocols and lifestyle protocols. Uh, so this is uh, my outline. I'm going to talk about my genetics to epigenetics journey, the synergies of low carb plus fasting, the practical benefits that I've observed my clients, other IDM clients, my wife, social media, um, and then delve into some papers on what the science says, what we think are some of the mechanisms. And then I'm going to contrast Ansel Keys. Can we get the boo? boo. <laughs> so, so in addition to the six and seven K, or seven country studies, K rations, he also did the Minnesota starvation experiments. And then there's somebody that everyone should know of, just like John Yutkin, they should know about George Cahill. So I want to contrast um, calorie restriction to cycling between fasting and feasting and the very different physiological responses. And uh, talk about, of course, insulin resistance and fasting and some of my um, thoughts and observations and conclusions and things I've learned along the way of my six-year journey so far. So in 1993, um, I'm 53, so I was doing my dissertation, sorry, thesis, thesis in 1993. I actually had to go to the university libraries, get out <laughs> microfiche and go to the stacks. So uh, those of you who uh, are living now, um, it's a quite an enjoyable time to uh, be a, inquirer, a wellness explorer, as it were, 
at the palm of your hand, you can literally do a thesis or a dissertation. So it's uh, amazing times we're living in. But my mom had been diagnosed as a manic depressive, and that was a big part of my life. I remember going to group therapy sessions, and um, a first cousin of hers was also diagnosed that way. And I was in a very small family, and I had a lot of anxiety and racing mind and depression and what I didn't understand at that time. So that was a lifelong condition for me. I, I thought I was steeply um, embedded in the genetic theory. I started as a chemical engineer at Berkeley. I actually swiveled to molecular biology. I worked in Gunther Stent's lab for a little bit, completely unglamorous. I was taking care of leeches. <laughs> <laughs> Low person on the totem pole. But then I'm a very holistic thinker, and I swivel to geography. So my degrees are in geography. And if people are aware of Weston Price and his amazing work, that work that laid the foundation for his physical degeneration book is something called cultural ecology. And ironically, that was one of the things that I did in geography. So I'm very holistic. But in 1993, I self-diagnosed myself as being manic depressive. I, later on, I realized I didn't actually have any manic episodes. So I actually asked, and I, and I blame myself for this, I asked the school psychiatrist for lithium, and he said, sure. <laughs> and this, this, is all, um, this is all N equals one. I want to be, I'm not making any statement for any other human being on the planet about approaches. Um, However, so what happened was that and possibly mold exposure, that was during my master's. I did get into a, a PhD program in a different university, and I literally, I think a combination of at least those doses and the type of lithium, and that I'm, I'm not bipolar, plus possible mold exposure. I went from about 220 to 350 in about eight months and I literally lost the ability to read. So I had worked my whole life to become a professional scientist, and it, it, instead of a dream, it was just a disaster. So that was the genetic paradigm. Then ironically, exactly 20 years later, how many people have heard of um, Mark Sisson and epigenetics? So I realized in retrospect that I had heard of epigenetics since high school. I don't know um, for younger folks, but does anyone else remember in high school biology the, the plant that's yellowed and weathered leaves? And then they're like, this is the same plant in a better soil, and it's flourishing. And anyone else get that in high school biology? OK. Some. And uh, phenotype, or genotype, rather, and phenotype? High school biology or college? So. So the explanation, and it's so fundamental to what we're all trying to accomplish with lifestyle, is the theory of epigenetics. And that is that what's most determinant in terms of our health on, on many different levels are our lifestyle inputs. And of course, me and my wife started with, with diet. But then there's also the quality. So there, there's macros, and there's the quality of the food. Then there's when and how often. Then there's sleep, um, you know, stress, um, uh, your personal relationships. So broadly speaking, lifestyle determines our phenotype. And I'll show you our, see if this works now. Yay. Oops. Kind of. So that's um, essentially um, <laughs> a pheno uh, genotype to phenotype. And uh, my lovely wife supported me from the get-go. So at home, we, I said, hun, I, I don't ever want to buy bread and pasta. And at that time, potatoes 
anymore, and she supported me. Even though this was my, what I call go time, or finding my why, she was 100% in support in the house. And she ate and loved the meals. I became the main cook. She's an awesome cook. I grew up, my mom didn't know how to cook at all. She actually burnt rice. and <laughs> So I was actually the cook growing up. And ironically, the things that I loved cooking <laughs> are some of the mainstays now. So I had some ancestral wisdom, even as a kid. I, I didn't know it at the time. But, um, and there's our daughter. And if you follow me on social media, let me give her more airtime. Oh, first... I knew I was going after Dave, so I'm about as far away from Dave in terms of frequency as possible. I get one blood test a year at most, sometimes one every year and a half. But I want to point out that um, prior to starting my uh, low-carb and paleo journey, fasting journey, my trigs over HDL were between six, six and seven routinely. And there's a Harvard paper, if the trigs over HDL are above four, you have a 16 times risk of heart disease. And about a year, so I started in May 2013. The October 2014, that ratio was less than one. And it's remained less than one all the way through my last one in late 2018. So... That's my, the extent of my blood work. Uh, <laughs> oops, let me uh, go back to my daughter. So uh, our daughter's adopted. And talk about the power of epigenetics. Her bio mom was homeless. And she was placed in our house at eight months. Prior to that, she was on soy formula. She was um, third percentile for height had bad skin conditions. So yeah, I'm getting goosebumps. So this is, um, so these pictures, that was actually at KetoCon last year. Um, my daughter has eyes for the beef rib bone only, not, not Dr. Barry in the background. And uh, she can, uh, there's a wonderful article called Clara's Kids that came out during the depression. And uh, I urge everyone to look that up. But what's amazing about her, and I learned so much about her, we're raising her as a real food kid, and we kind of came up with this slogan. And so we say that raising a real food kid is hard because we prepare her meals daily. We do not, my wife's an elementary school teacher. We're very fortunate with our knowledge. Um, she doesn't have to eat the school meals. Most of the kids that say, underprivileged school, so the entire school gets free breakfasts and lunches. So we understand how privileged we are and our daughter is. Um, but the one, so that was at a farmer's market. I had bought a cabbage from a, a CSA that we love. And uh, <laughs> she literally, she couldn't wait to get it home. She was just munching on the cabbage. And then one night we were doing uh, arugula and pork chops, and uh, she sometimes, her, her eyes are bigger, so she got a bunch of arugula, about twice as much as I was having. And I was like, no way, kid, but I, I went with it, and, and uh, she actually finished that portion, and then she asked for more. And, and what's really um, fascinating about her is she cycles. She just inherently cycles. So. We have seaweed at our house, and I don't know if she senses an iodine um, low level, but she'll want um, seaweed for like two or three days, or she'll, she'll want arugula. I, I bought radishes a couple months ago, and she couldn't get enough radishes, and then I bought it like three days later, and she didn't want much of the second batch. So um, it's really fascinating to watch. She's not a science experiment. <laughs> She's my daughter. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. but, so um, it's ironic. Uh, Endgame came out today. So any uh, Marvel fans, thank you much for <laughs> not going. <laughs> but, uh, but sorry, now everyone's depressed. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
So that's commitment. So uh, um, one of the Marvel movies that came out a few years ago was Doctor Strange. And it was a good one, not my favorite, but I loved one of the trailers. I just loved the trailers. So in there, there's this line that I can't forget. And it's the ancient one saying to Doctor Strange when he's lost his way, ironically, his conventional teaching that did help people in some ways was no longer healing him. He was questioning everything that he had learned up to that point. And she says to him, do you wonder what I see in you? Possibilities. And uh, that's, that's what I see with my IDM clients or just, just out and about. Um, and everyone that's in the, wherever they are in their healing journey. And certainly what I see for me, my wife, and my daughter. So in a way, um, yeah, I'm not a graphic designer. <laughs> but um, in a way, it's been like an hourglass. That really describes. So when we're born, we have all this potential, all this health potential. And I think a lot of that, actually, from my research and readings and listening to podcasts, and I think we're all born, um, hopefully, with not all of us, but um, most of us with very healthy mitochondria. And we're going to talk more about mitochondria. And I really think a big part of health is health of your mitochondria and health at the cellular, cellular level. So we're all, most of us are born healthy. Um, you know, nature is very good at that. And uh, then through lifestyle, instead of that staying with our potential for a lot of us, especially on standard modern diets, that narrows. And then that was my go time in 2013. Um, my uncle, who is my father figure, got advanced um, Alzheimer's. Um, I was almost 48. I didn't think I was going to make 50. So it's ironic I'm doing longevity for IDM. I'm 50, almost 54 now. But what a successful health journey can do is get us our potential back, which again is epigenetics. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, so this is about the synergies between uh, additional benefits of low carb and fasting. And if you're familiar with Dr. Fung's work and his books, um, when you eat, they've had thousands of people at their clinic. I work in a different part of IDM. We have clients, not patients. And I've had many clients myself, and I've sat in on sessions with all our educators. We have eight now. And I'm going to go to the synergies that are reported. And what's fascinating about this is this was part of my journey, my wife's journey, what people mention on social media. Those of you on low-carb journeys and low-carb with fasting, um, once you've become, we'll talk a little bit more about this, fat adapted. And that's my key for my clients to, there's no set protocol, but my goal for everyone is for them to have their ancestral access to their body fat. I see Ivor um, back there, and uh, he's a big fan of Gabor Dorsey, and uh, um, he really helped me understand the Facebook group Lower Insulin, that our adipose system is on our side. It's an organ. It's dynamic. It's there. It's how humans survived. It's elegant and amazing. But these are some practical benefits. So you won't you will find these in scientific journals. I'm a citizen scientist and a citizen healer. And really, the most important thing for everyone sitting here is their antecedent. It's, it's their n equals 1. What works best for all of you out there? Me, my wife, and my daughter are all doing different things appropriate. Believe it or not, my daughter's in a calorie surplus. <laughs> Because um, she actually, I, we don't measure calories, but she probably has more than me. But why would that be appropriate for her? Well, she's growing. <laughs> so I would you know, not treat her like one of my clients who wanted to lose excess um, 
organ fat or um, excess, uh, uh, even subcutaneous fat. Uh, subcutaneous fat is great to a certain level, then it can be pro-inflammatory. So um, for me, um, which better mood for me? So I have a leaky gut and a leaky blood-brain barrier. So I have a double suck on SAD. <laughs> I suck mentally and physically. Um, uh, uh, so, and then the reduced hunger. The reduced hunger, if any of you follow Dr. Tro, um, my wife and I were lucky enough to tape something about a week ago, so it's not out yet. But when your hunger is under control, and I had this insight when I started my journey that I was going to go on a diet, but diet in the old term of everything I do, but I was going on it to reduce my hunger because I was always hungry all the frickin' time. <laughs> I was constantly hungry, and then I started asking why, as a morbidly obese person, and, and it's funny how we don't ask, the, or you know, the conventional experts, shouldn't I not be hungry all the time without, with all this, at that point, 100 extra pounds of body fat? Why am I hungry all the time? And it was, it's never black and white. I'm not going to say it, there weren't emotional aspects to that. And Drew Manning is excellent on the emotional aspects and Carol coming up. Um, but there was a physical sensation of hunger all the time. And why is that as a morbidly obese person for over 20 years? And it was often hangriness. <laughs> and my poor wife, so I didn't like the quality of my life very much. And, you know, there's really practical cost savings, there's time savings. I don't particularly like to do dishes, I love to cook. What's the ultimate um, not having to do dishes? You, you didn't eat that day. <laughs> and, and the control, as you go on your journeys, the control's really great if you flex your fasting muscle and you incorporate that because you have more ability in more situations. When you're traveling, some of you may be traveling, maybe we're on a plane like me, um, you may not be around food that you want to eat. You know, there's, we try and minimize certain foods. Um, I'm grain-free except for very occasional white rice. There are still food sensitivities. So fasting gives me an extra element of control and then there's, um, we'll go over some of the other benefits. Oh, and the passive calorie deficit. So I was in a passive calorie deficit, but the beauty of low carb and also low carb plus fasting when you become a fat adapted beast is that part of your daily calories come from your own body fat stores. So that's very important um, eating to your macros, remember that there's no practical way to measure how much of your daily calories are coming from your body fat. So I feel, and I tell this to my client, it's better to eat to hunger. You know, have, have a, a, on your eating days, have a good amount of protein, which varies from person to person on so many factors. Um, you know, have the carbs that you're comfortable with. And then the rest should be fat, but that should not be based on any necessarily macro calculator once you've become, it can in the beginning, but once you become fat adapted, you really wanna to eat to hunger because some of those calories are gonna be coming from your body fat. Oh, and enjoying food more is ironic, huh, isn't that? So my, my wife mentioned that, she, uh, I love that one. She got into a little bit of uh, eating snacking when the school year started for various reasons. And then she told me one day, you know, I'm, I'm snacking. Like, I'm just, she caught herself. I wasn't going to say, <laughs> which is great. That's how you want it to happen. And she's like, I, I'm just not enjoying food. So um, there's somebody French that I can't, but hunger is the best sauce. Um, but when you get into fasting, it's not, it's not like the hangry hunger. It's, it's a, more of a almost pleasant, like, oh, it's time to eat now. 
So um, for the next part of the journey, what is healing, what is health, and the levels of organization of our bodies. So I'm gonna just do a little bit um, on mitochondria and the cell, so keep these in mind. And how does low carb plus fasting act on these different levels? So um, we're all eukaryotes, <laughs> that's your family tree. And so are worms and so are fungus and so are plants. And the reason that this is so important, so we have cholesterol, plants have um, chlorophyll, but the reason why in mice or in, <laughs> you have to take, or in earthworms or even yeast, you have to take it with a grain of real salt, Redmond, real salt. Um, you do, but on the other hand, we all are eukaryotes. And then cells make up tissues, tissues make up organ. So a lot of health is determined by the health of your mitochondria and your health at a cellular level. And there's other organelles. So briefly on mitochondria, um, sorry, I don't have another picture. My opening slide had a picture of mitochondria. But we're all familiar that mitochondria are the energy parts of the cell. And low carb literally changes and becoming fat adapted how our metabolism works. We actually have control. We're a hybrid engine. Mitochondria can burn both glucose or free fatty acids and ketones. And you are in control of what they're gonna burn. But in addition to being the powerhouses, there's also a fascinating 2016 paper by Robert Navarro. They're also, he termed it the danger response system. So if you ever wondered why you get tired when you may be fighting off a cold, so normally mitochondria, mitochondria are kind of sensing the health of the cell. So when there are some invaders, they want to ramp up oxidation at times and, and other processes. They want to switch from energy production, at least some of the cells, to fighting illness. And so they actually switch modes. So that's why we get tired. I just found that out recently. So Robert Navarro. Um, so we're now, um, autophagy is in the news since the Nobel Prize. And it's amazing, and, and I have the slide up, but I'll, I'll explain it. Um, Mike Mutzel, who will be later, he explained it as, um, let's say you lived in a one-room apartment that, that is your, your cell, and then there's different levels. Not only mitochondria can undergo um, autophagy and, and uh, mitosis, but the Golgi apparatus, other organelles can. But without autophagy, without, like never taking the trash out, it, it just, your apartment will start to, to stink and decay and not be a very pleasant or functional place to live in. So autophagy is our natural rejuvenation. And what's so interesting is not just us, but other life forms eat, evolved a way when we didn't have access to food to turn that into a win-win situation. We got the nutrients and the energy we needed from ourselves. We're actually eating ourselves, but we're very wise. Our bodies are infinitely wiser than <laughs> all the scientists put together. We're just figuring nature out. Um, so what would be the best way for the organism to survive? To eat the most damaged parts, the most damaged cells, the most damaged organelles, not the new fresh ones from the previous round of fasting, but the ones that maybe didn't get renewed in that round. So our body, body wisdom. All right, 12 minutes. Um, these are some of the mechanisms, and I didn't want to get to the nitty gritty science here, but I did want to point out one thing that's fascinating when I'm researching this. So sirtuins are conserved from yeast, or as far as I know, every, your, 
uh, your co you know, all, all our family. Sorry. And one of the other interesting things that I love, when you trigger autophagy, and we're still in the learning process of when autophagy is triggered, and I'll get to that. But one of the really cool things is that um, we, we hear about oxidants or antioxidants. So when you trigger autophagy, you're actually creating the FOXO genes and the sirtuins, but mostly the FOXO. You're producing an antioxidant within the mitochondria. So no matter how good your diet is, if you have a diet full of you know, uh, antioxidants, at still you create through both low carb or keto and, and fasting, through lifestyle choices, you're actually triggering, triggering the mitochondria themselves to produce endogenous mitochondrial antioxidants. So that's really cool. And then we're going to get to uh, TRE stands for time restricted eating. So um, I mentioned um, inflammation. And uh, one of the really cool things, so, um, and by all means, I encourage people to measure their blood ketones, especially in the first part of their health journeys. So there's this really cool pathway, um, the NLRP3, so both low carb, keto, so what you eat and when you eat can in increase um, acetone and BHB. And that's um, an anti-inflammatory process, so really cool. Um, I mentioned uh, either time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting and then fasting, longer extended fast, um, are the best, one of the best ways to increase AMPK. This is from Dr. Fung and J, um, James D. Nicolatino's latest book, The Longevity Solution. So um, some of the main mechanisms when you're increasing your AMPK. Um, so this is actually at the mitochondrial level. The paper on the left talks about um, increased lifespan and, and fusion and fission dynamics of mitochondrial systems. And then, um, What's really cool is that fasting and other things like exercise and low carb itself, because when you, when you become fat adapted, you, your body senses the need for more mitochondria. When you fast, what really you're, you're triggering your body, you're providing a signal to your body when you fast that it has to get more efficient with less food. So you're signaling it that your body needs more mitochondria. So you start increasing your mitochondrial biodensity. When you start exercising, that's also a signal, hey, I need to be able to produce more energy because all of a sudden this guy or gal is jumping or running or dancing. Dancing's good exercise. Dance-offs with my daughter. <laughs> Try and go five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah. My dogs participate too, so it's a family dance off. But so you're triggering your body to produce more mitochondria. So that's mitochondrial biodensity. What's really cool about that is you're then spreading the load out among your mitochondria. So day in and day out, your mitochondria are going to be healthier because when you have more of them, there's less load to produce energy that you need for that day. So it's very cool. Um, so I wanted to define some terms that you're likely to see out on social media and your um, Facebook groups and books and so forth. So autophagy, I, def I um, defined already. Mitophagy is at the mitochondrial level in previous, and apoptosis. So our bodies are capable of sensing we rejuvenate cells. And it can come, that's how when you get a, um, I actually cut myself shaving this morning and I, I uh, actually, okay, here's one. I, uh, well, I actually heal faster now when I cut myself shaving. 
And I wanted to mention my daughter. We live in Austin, Texas, and you saw her, how good her skin's become and my wife's skin. We haven't used sunscreen um, for since our journey began, and we're in central Texas. So um, our bodies have the capacity, and wouldn't you be healthier if your apoptosis is working correctly, that your body's triggering the cell death? You know, that probably has a lot of overlap with cancer that, you know, that we're not um, as apoptosis sensitive <laughs> as we should be. So many chronic lifestyle diseases, when you, when you think about dementia and cancer in particular or um, any degenerative disease or muscle disease, I'm, I'm now in less pain and healthy, healthiest that I've ever, I couldn't do pull-ups you know, when I was a teenager and now I can. So I want my health span to match my lifespan. Is that what we all want? So that's gonna involve autophagy. So I seem to be, and all of you can too, renewing my organs. So it's, it's exciting times to be alive. Um, I wanted to mention Keyes and Cahill, and George Cahill again is such a contrast to Keyes. Keyes did the Minnesota starvation experiments. I'm gonna to get to that next slide. What's fascinating about him is he did 1,800 calories a day, day in, day out. That doesn't seem, 1,800 calories a day, but it was just standard modern eating. It was um, high carb and eating quite frequently and snacking. So um, look up Cahill. I just wanted to point out, this was a summary of his work, so if you, take a picture of that slide. But that's kind of an obscure journal, right? I don't, why wasn't it in a major, you know, the New England Journal of Medicine? It was in the Transactions of the American Clinical and Climatological Association. <laughs> so I don't know even then if, you know, why was he being, was his work being blackballed in a way? But you can see that he was able to show that as fasting goes on, we don't starve, we just trigger different sources of energy. You know, just like Dr. Fung and many of the fasting groups you go to. So, um, <laughs> so um, the gentleman on the right is um, Sim Land. Um, I follow him, if you've never heard of him, he's a very good follow. And uh, these are the results of 1,800 calories a day without fasting, but ironically eating quite frequently. So if you wonder why you might have failed on conventional advice, it's because the gentleman on the left is starting to cannibalize things that his body doesn't want to cannibalize. And so that's triggering hunger. He was telling them, and they became psychotic with, um, they were dreaming about food and, and look up Minnesota, so I'm running out of time, so I want to go. But um, Sim Lan did a three-day fast, and then he, he did a refeed, and there's always a fasting cycle. So you may temporarily, your body's primed to, to lose a, a little bit of um, protein. You know, when you uh, go over, say, depending on the person, 18, 24 hours. But then when you refeed, and you always refeed, and you refeed well, you've triggered a lot of human growth hormone and testosterone. So if you look at a fasting and feasting cycle, it's a great way to put on lean muscle. And we've seen that, I've seen that, my wife's seen that, IDM clients have seen it, IDM educators. Um, but there's different fasting protocols. Each one of my clients and other clients are unique. I'm not treating each of them the same. Um, their health status, what they're wanting to achieve, um, what type of foods they like, uh, where, how old they are sometimes, obviously their health conditions. So, um, and most IDM clients, it's 42 hours or less. I don't know, there's this perception of, you know, ah, you know, Dr. Fung, you know, 68 day fast, that's just not, <laughs> um, it's just not reality. Um, I wanna mention this, there's so many studies out showing that exercise is a great trigger of autophagy and especially facet exercise. And kudos to Doc Nally. I get up 
early. I've noticed the last few days in our hotels, he's, <laughs> I, I see him coming back. So he's, he's definitely doing facet exercise in the morning. Um, and that slides courtesy of Mike Mutzel. This paper is just coming out. Dominic D. Agostino, um, ketone bodies have anti-catabolic effects in skeletal muscle. Um, these are just a couple of um, newer studies that when you're fasting, it's tri selectively triggering within that mitochondria the fat burning. So like we've all experienced the synergies. Let me, um, so this is how you can explain fasting to your doctor. <laughs> and uh, one of the, um, really what is um, body fat for? And the electron transport chain. So a lot of insulin resistance is actually the body trying to prevent um, oxidation within the cell. By having periods of not eating, you literally clear out mitochondria to be more receptive and better able to handle your next meal. So that's a simple way, and I'm gonna... Um, so the levels of healing are from the mitochondria, healthy cells, and then something called hormesis, and to me the Bruce Lee quote is about hormesis. Um, I love this quote by Voltaire, um, and doctors, you're wonderful, and coaches, but really it's nature is what heals us. So in a lot of ways, our lifestyle health journeys are the art of getting out of our own way. I'm gonna go hopefully just a minute over. Um, I love this David Bowie quote. Um, I found that I can help people more when they want to get healthy. Um, instead of using the word need, if they, if they say they want. And also, I also find, make people aware that you're trying to help, that in their first month, it's likely to be the hardest part of a whole health journey, and that they should expect that because you're retooling your metabolism. So I call the first month, fake it until you make it. Some people can go from a standard diet to keto, 30, 20 grams. Some need to transition down. It's all N equals one. The, you'll have the best success with anyone when they're at their read, ready stage. Uh, they're at their go time. So let me just talk about go time. Two more words, um, some more Bruce Lee. Um, but, um, oh, I think it was the previous slide. So two things, respect the dignity of the journey of people around you. Some people will not decide to go on the journey at all. Others will not go on a journey on your time frame, but their time frame. So protect your energy. Be there for support, be there as an example, but, and also, if you start a journey and it doesn't work, maybe the next one will. So be kind to yourself always. Always be kind to yourself. It's progress, not perfection. That's um, my wife, my daughter, and um, my wife's, my mother-in-law, her mom, and the James Taylor song, and I'll end with this. No one can tell me, or you, or anyone, that you're doing anything wrong, all the conventional experts in the world, if you have a smiling face. So that's, so let's listen. So that's, a, that's, that's my email. <laughs>